Okay. Let's get this wrapped up. Show of hands, how many people have ever dealt with a difficult person? Good, because Derek's getting ready to tell you how to stick it to him. Derek Murray has a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology and a Master of Science degree in leadership from Grand Canyon University. Derek is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, and before entering the world of sterile processing in 2015, Derek spent 25 years as an educator and trainer in the public school system. After working as a training specialist and manager of operations for a major medical software company, he is currently our Director of Professional Services here at Census. Derek's passion is to equip and empower people with the tools necessary to be their very best self, not only in the workplace, but also in the arena of everyday life. Derek currently resides in the greater St. Louis area with his wife of 35 years, Cece. They have two grown daughters and a grandson. Please help me welcome Derek Murray. Good afternoon, C-Tuck. You can turn it up a little. What you want, this is a song of every leader. What you need, you know I got it. All I'm asking is for a little respect when I talk to work. Yes, just a little bit. You can stand up, it's okay. The SPD in the OR2. Everyone's acting. It's like a zoo. What am I gonna do? I need a little. Just a little respect. Just a little bit. Coming to work with an attitude. Can't you be in a better mood? I'm ready to fire you. It's a little bit of conflict there, you think? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. All right. I am so honored to be here with you guys today. We're going keep to keep it going. I'm just talking in the little interlude there. I've not always been the best communicator, but someone just stole my lunch from the refrigerator. Conflict? Oh yeah, it's on. You think? Just a little bit, just a little bit, come on. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, take care of S-P-D. Oh, oh yes. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Just a little bit of respect, that's all we're asking. All right, we're good. Thank you, everybody. It is, like I said, an honor and a privilege to be here, my first C-Tech, to um, just communicate with you and talk a little bit about conflict and conflict management, conflict resolution. Um, what responsibility do we have as leaders when it comes to conflict? So, first of all, I will tell you a little bit about me. There's a picture of my beautiful family there, my two daughters, grandson, me and my wife. Uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, California. As uh, Jim said, married 35 years, about to be 36 next month to my beautiful wife, Cece. Uh, 25 years in the education field, a teacher and trainer, so um, I will refer to that here and, and then because that's been kind of the, the crux of my life a little bit. Um, lived in North Pole, Alaska for 11 years. Um, and you heard all the rest. And certified life coach, I'm an ordained minister, and I'm just plain happy to be on the planet. You know, it's a good day 
through conflict, through thick, through thin, it's a good day when you wake up every morning. It's a good day. So let's get into this a little bit. So what do you think comes to mind? This was originally a breakout session, so I had some interactive things. But you know what? This is the last session. We're in Music City. That's why I said, you know, I got to start off with some music. Hello. Um, so what one word comes to mind when you hear the word conflict? Just shout it out. Anger. Disrespect. Frustration. Jealousy. Confusion. What was? Adversity. Hangers. <laughs> so are there any similarities or running themes in the words associated with conflict? That they're all negative. Hmm. So let's look at what conflict is. It's an emotional state, so that lets us know emotions are involved. As leaders, we have to realize that the people that we have the stewardship of leading come to work with emotions. You can't separate it. You can't deny it. They come to work. Unless you want robots, you're going to have emotions. So it's a, an emotional state between two persons, can be more than two persons, but usually between two, uh, in a relationship. So that's another key word. There is a relationship involved. So where disagreement or misunderstanding about needs, drives, wishes, or demands uh, has occurred. It's an express struggle between at least two independent parties who perceive. So there's perceptions, emotions, all of these things that are involved with conflict. They perceive incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference from others in achieving those goals. So there's a perception that maybe they won't get to the goal that they're trying to get to. But remember, perception. So we have to do perception checking. And then problems occur when the differences between the two or more people necessitate change. So there's emotions, change. All of these things are involved when there's conflict. We all know that change can sometimes be very difficult for some. Some jump right into change. But change can be hard sometimes. So we have to realize that there's a necessity of a change in at least one person in order for the relationship to continue to grow and develop. I want to tell you that in relationships and in conflict, it's really important that we realize that even though there's conflict going on, we want to make sure that we salvage the relationship. Because guess what? Tomorrow, I got to face you. The next day, I have to face you again, unless I try to run and hide in my office or whatever. But we have to realize that, yes, we have to face people. I always look at conflict as, first, it begins with me. So what am I doing on a daily basis? I love this statement here. I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in my office, whoops, in my, work, in my workplace, my home, uh, in my classroom I was. It was me that I'm the decisive element in my world. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. You know, you're weather creators. Every day you come into the office, people sense what mood you're in. You can walk in, he's smiling. Everybody's like, oh, Derek's coming in, he's having a good day. If I'm not smiling, I tell people, uh-oh, better look for a mushroom cloud somewhere in the distance because I'm usually <laughs> smiling when I come in. I try to, try to do that. But it is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make, now think of that one person right now, don't say it out loud, that one person that maybe gets under your skin more than anybody else. It could be a spouse. It could be a coworker. It could be anybody. But that one person, I have the power to make that person's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor. I can hurt or heal. In all situations, it's not their response. It's my response. 
that decides whether the crisis will be escalated or de-escalated, a person humanized or dehumanized. So it's important, we wanna make sure that we salvage relationships, that we make sure that people feel like they're people. They're people first. They're not workers, they're not folks that work for us or anything first, they're people. And we have to deal with them on that basis. This statement, believe it or not, is by Dr. Haim Gano. He's a Holocaust survivor. Think about that. His response, even in the place of being totally wrong, he realized his response would make a difference, even to his captors. So relationships and conflict, you can't get away from it. It is inevitable. You will have conflict. It will happen. The goal is to face conflict in a way that's constructive and not destructive. We don't want to tear people down. We want to build them up. We want to maintain their human dignity and respect. We want to build open communication. Communication is usually the key to conflict. Uh, you know, you've got sender, you've got receiver, and then in the middle, you got all kinds of inter interference going on. So it's important that we request sometimes clarification so that we don't end up in a conflict because people can perceive one thing. We know that by emails. You know, somebody says something and they put capital letters. What does that mean? They are yelling at me. So we have to request clarification and find out exactly what the person is trying to communicate to the sender, so, uh, the, to the receiver, so that then there's no interference and we know exactly what the message is and then we can uh, lessen uh, any kind of conflict. And then, it, it's really built on proactive versus reactive interactions. We want to be more proactive in our interactions with people, not always reacting, because reacting will get us into a place where we're constantly just on edge. So we want to be more proactive in our communication and in our interactions. And that builds trust and acceptance and respect. Still on relationships and conflict, when conflict arises, we have to look at the relationship we have with the person involved. What kind of relationship do you have with the person? I realized that when I was teaching, um, if I didn't have a relationship with a student, then I wasn't the one that needed to, to interact with that person. Um, I would go and find someone that they trusted and then have them do the interaction. So sometimes we don't have good relationships with people and maybe we need to find out someone that does so that then they can be like the intermediary that helps us through a conflict. Also, if there is a relationship, is it healthy? We can have unhealthy relationships even in the workplace, of course, everyone knows that. Sometimes we put off dealing with people we have termed difficult due to our own conflict experience. So if your conflict experience has been negative, guess what? Every time you went into a conflict, to you, it's gonna be a negative, a whole negative experience. And that brings me to the conflict cycle. So as you can see there, your attitudes or beliefs about conflict color the entire cycle. So the conflict occurs, your response happens, then the consequence or outcome, and guess what that does? It reinforces your feeling or your attitude or your belief about conflict and about what it, and about what it is. Dealing with people we deem as difficult or uh, is actually subjective. It's subjective to our own conflict experience. Um, so I want you to take a moment, turn to the person next to you, and I want you to just, we're gonna take one minute, and I want you to discuss a conflict experience. What was the outcome? Did the outcome influence your view of conflict? So do that real quickly, I'll give you a minute. Here we go. Time's up, so just, it's good to share with other people. Sometimes you can gain some insight from others who have gone through certain conflict. Um, 
and get some real insight onto how they handled it, how maybe they didn't handle it so good. Um, you know, I've had my share of conflicts of things where I didn't handle it so well. Um, I think conflict happens more with people that we are really close to. Um, it seems like that's more of where conflict really arises, people that we really are close with, maybe in the workplace or even in our families, where we end up in conflict. So like I said before, we want to make sure that we salvage those relationships because we still have to come together, we still have to work together, all of those things. So how do you view conflict? Is conflict something that needs to be avoided? Do you run the other direction when conflict happens? Um, is, something, is it something that needs to be controlled? We call it the flight, uh, fight or freeze syndrome. Um, or can conflict lead to valuable collaboration, healthy workplace relationships, and effective organizational change? I believe it can. So here we will talk about a little bit about emotions. Like I said, you cannot separate emotions from conflict. Um, archaic leadership models from the past say, why do I have to deal with a person, person's emotions? Why do I have to do that? Um, you know, you go to work, do your job, go home, and repeat it. Remember, in Groundhog Day, I told you, I wake up every day, right here, right in Punxsutawney, and uh, it's always February 2nd, so it's just the same thing every day, every day. Don't bring your personal problems to work. Check your emotions at the door. You can pick them up again when you leave. <laughs> Some people believe that. Don't want emotions at work, but that's really unrealistic. As people, we bring our problems, our failures, our issues, our hopes, our dreams, our successes, all of that come in a bundled package called you. And you bring it to work every day. And so we as leaders have a responsibility uh, to be emotionally intelligent, to, be, uh, to understand emotions in a way that um, helps someone that, is, that I'm leading to, that I can understand their emotions and thereby help them to self-actualize in the end, uh, to be successful. And so that really looks like not putting things on people that they can't handle. Uh, as a leader, I, I should not put a, a task or something on you that I know you're gonna fail at. I wanna give you something that I know you're going to succeed because that will help build you up as a person. So those are our, some of the archaic models uh, of leadership. Emotions and conflict, like I said, they can't be separated. Emotions drive the behavior. So you have to look at what's driving the behavior of the person that you're leading. True conflict management happens when we choose our behavior during conflict. We're responding, we're self-regulating rather than just reacting. So it's good to respond rather than react. React comes from, the, from a place where you just are impulsive and you react. But we wanna choose our behaviors so that then we can respond to people and help them through the conflict. So emotional intelligence, it's understanding your own emotions to be more empathetic with others, putting yourself in their shoes, understanding what they're going through, not so much that you have to stay there, but just seeing things from their perspective so that you can help them to succeed. Um, it involves managing your own emotions, self-regulation, as I said, and then active listening, discerning the emotions behind the words. And then the choice to look beyond someone's fault and see the real need. That was something that I really had to look at. Uh, working in special education for 25 years um, was, it had its hard days. 
Um, you're dealing with all kinds of kids from, I dealt with early childhood, kids affected by autism that were just diagnosed, to kids that were up to 21 years old uh, that still needed some help um, through life to help them to be able to be able to succeed at just having a normal job, um, getting work done, whatever it was. And so that became very important for me to look beyond what was happening because when you have words coming at you, you can take offense to that really quickly and really easy. But I learned to look past that and understand there was something really that they're trying to communicate to me. So it was, it was my job as a leader to make sure that I looked past that and saw the real need, the real voice. That's what we're called to do as well, uh, to see and to hear what's really going on with this person. How can I really be effective with them to help them through this certain area that they're in so that they can get unstuck and move forward and be successful? So that also involves what people need to do their jobs effectively. Um, how can we empower them to perform optimally? Every area must be explored. Their psychological needs, physiological needs, esteem needs. Um, Maslow, um, a psychologist, also has this, um, what he calls the hierarchy of needs. It's a proactive approach. I'm just going to go psychology on you for one minute. But this is a real basis of understanding sometimes why people get stuck, why you end up in conflict. When certain needs aren't met along this triangle, that's where people get stuck a lot of times. So sometimes we have to look at what's going on in a person's life. Are they feeling, a lot of times this part of the triangle here, most people have, you know, breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, not always sleep in our industry. Um, but those are the physiological needs. Um, safety and security needs, health, employment, property, family, social stability. Um, and then friendships, family, intimacy, sense of connection. Sometimes folks don't feel connected and you can get into a place of, of conflict there. And it goes on up to being able to self-actualize or being able to move forward and be successful and get the job done. So these are things that sometimes we have to look at. The result, self-regulation, would I regulate my own feelings as a leader and I have proactive interactions with people, then guess what? Trust is increased. They trust what I'm doing is going to help them and be of benefit to them throughout any kind of conflict. Also, self-awareness uh, equals increased loyalty. And then motivation, increased performance. And that's really what we're looking for. And then empathy equals less conflict. When I'm able to stand in someone's shoes and see what they're seeing, then it lessens the conflict because they realize, you know what, he really, Derek really understands what I'm talking about. He's not just putting on, but he's really identifying what I'm seeing He's validating things that I'm feeling. And sometimes people can feel, you know, different kinds of feelings, different things that they're perceiving. Um, we can't just brush those things aside. We have to validate the things that they're feeling that they're seeing in the conflict so that then they don't feel brushed off or feel like we're not paying attention to them. The action equation, do plus no equals feel. The do is what leaders communicate. The no is delivering information in a memorable way, just like I did with a song. Delivered you information there. Feel, feel is the catalyst that motivates people and employees to action. It's attaching emotional connections between employees and their work. One thing I want to say, I've just been in this industry for four years. I celebrated four years um, 
with census here, was formerly applied logic. Um, it has been eye-opening for me. Coming out of education, I never even knew that a sterile processing department existed in a hospital. Didn't even know. Um, I've had people in my life, me personally, I've never had to have surgery, um, but my wife has, my mom, my dad. Um, I went through a, a whole uh, years with my dad who was battling leukemia and then in the hospital with him, staying in the hospital with him until he passed away 10 years ago. So I've had, I've had intimate, um, just all kinds of other people in my life that have been touched by this, uh, by this industry. And coming into it, I was just floored. And now I'm like your biggest advocate, man. I'm like, yes, these people that work here in this department are the most important people in this hospital. What you do touches every aspect of the hospital, every single one. And it, it's in, so important to create those emotional connections with people and their work. If that means that sometimes you might have to have the OR come down and have their scrum in the SPD, make it happen so that then they can begin to be more empathetic about what your needs are in your department and vice versa, taking them up to the OR while they're in the middle of a surgery, letting them see what's going on and the work that they've done with patient safety. That is the bottom line. That is something that I'm passionate about now in my job and realizing that the responsibility that I have to make sure that I lead people and that people feel um, the importance of what they're doing. That is so important to make those emotional connections to your work. That creates the passion for this industry. When you create those emotional connections, then the passion is just like you are on fire and it doesn't matter what job you're doing, you know that you have a connection to that person that's in the OR that is staying alive. That is the main bottom line. So what motivates you? Remember, meaningful work has a greater staying power than a paycheck. Did you know that? What you do when you're passionate about something, it's not about the paycheck. It's about coming to work every day and knowing you're making a difference, that you are connected to the success of the organization that you work in and that you're a part of. That's what drives people. So when we look at change and conflict, Change can be a big source of conflict. In most situations, we cannot control anything that's coming your way. You can't control that. As much as you'd like to and ward conflict off at the door, you can't. So what we can control is our response to it. How do I need to respond to someone where we're in conflict? So what do you need in order to reduce conflict during a change initiative? You come into factors of resistance to change where change can be effective and successful at all levels, but it must happen with those who will be uh, most affected by the change. So we see change, uh, conflict and change a lot because people don't feel like, they feel like change is being done to them instead of through them. So then you get resistance, you get conflict, you get pushback. So it becomes important that we communicate effectively through any kind of change process so that it lessens the conflict. How does this change affect me and my position? People need to see the reason behind the change. A lot of times we don't communicate that well as leaders um, how change is going to affect you and where you are in your certain position. So then you get conflict that arises. So it's important for us to communicate. You know the old thing that says, just, you know, just do it because I said so. 
That did not ever work for me when I was teaching. <laughs> it did not. Students would push back. They would say, um, no, I need to know why, and it, then conflict would happen. Um, so I realized, hey, you know what? I need to give a reason behind the request that I'm giving because that helps give validity and it's something that they can hold on to and say, okay, this is the reason why we need to do this. So people need reason. They need to see the reason behind the change and how it's going to affect them, how they can navigate through it, and then we can help them through any kind of change. Also, one of the biggest things is what do I have to give up? Is there something in this that I am going to have to give up? That's a big one. And sometimes there is, so we have to communicate that to people. Yes, there is something that we'll, you'll have to give up, but we can be proactive in that and help them through the change, communicate it to them and help them through so that it lessens conflict as well. So conflict is usually the result of change. Change is not an event, it's a process. Changing the culture, involves changing attitudes and, behave and beliefs. And then in the absence of honest, passionate, and empathetic communication, people will then create their own information about change, and then that's how you get rumors and different things that develop. So remember that, that's an important thing through any change in initiative to reduce conflict. You want to go ahead and at least give people something that they can hang on to so that it helps them through the change and it reduces the, any conflict that might arise uh, because then they will make up their own reasons why this is happening. And then you have all kinds of things that you have to play rumor control and all of that with. So that's an important, important point. So creating a culture of conflict resolution again when employees at every level are engaged in the change process and feel as though their perspective, as we said, standing in their shoes, is being listened to and considered. Barriers to the change process uh, or conflict are drastically reduced. Trust is enhanced. And then you're empowered. And that's what my goal is as, whoops, as a leader, is to empower people to empower them to go forward, to give them the tools necessary that they need in order to get the job done. That is so important. That is my job as a leader, is to empower you, to make sure that you feel like you have everything that you need to succeed. So this is something that, you know, confrontation when we have to confront things in conflict, confrontation is like a four letter word. People want to run far from confrontation. So there is another way of doing this. Confrontation avoids taking ownership of our own feelings. We don't take ownership at all. We just place blame. It happens when we're mad enough, angry enough, disappointed enough, we take the risk of being rejected or isolated, and we're in essence managing or controlling our fears when we confront. So instead, we use care fronting. We take ownership of our feelings, we treat people with dignity, with respect in the conflict, and the concern for relationships, as I said at the beginning, Relationships are so important in conflict. Knowing that you have a relationship some, with someone and knowing that you're going to have to work with that person again, face that person again. So it's called care fronting. It's because I care about you and our relationship and I wanna see this relationship continue to grow and develop, I need to talk to you about something. So it takes the edge off of confrontation because it's a caring way of dealing with conflict. There's also a book by a gentleman named David Augsburger uh, called Caring Enough to Confront. So, 
Now, when we look at this, and we look at relationships and conflict, after we know what conflict really is, now we can look at this maybe a little bit differently. I've come to the conclusion that I'm the decisive element in my workplace. It's my approach that creates the climate. It's my mood that makes the weather. I tre possess tremendous power to make this person's miserable or, uh, life miserable or joyous. So hopefully we can then look at this in a different way and say, you know what, it's about me as a leader. It's about my response. Even though sometimes people think that, you know, I have a boss, I have a leader, everyone in this room leads at one time or another. So you can't shirk your responsibility and say, well, I'm not a leader. At some point or other, you will be a leader or you are a leader at certain points in your job, certain tasks that you're asked to lead. So we can't run from this. It is my response that decides whether or not a conflict is going to be resolved or else it's just going to perpetuate. So, what kind of weather are you creating? Is it sunshine, blue skies, next to palm trees? Are you creating that kind of oasis for people to come to you and have the feeling that they can trust you and that they know that you have their best interest at heart? Or are you creating that kind of weather? Hopefully it's this one. <laughs> Does look like Houston. So hopefully it's this one. Every now and then we can create some storms, but hopefully uh, those storms will clear up as we engage people, as we treat them with dignity, with respect, and understand where they're coming from and understand their perspective on where they are in a conflict. So we now have a new perspective on conflict. It's about taking ownership. It's about understanding others' emotions. It's about preferring others and understanding what we need to help them succeed. So conflict is the opportunity to become co-creators of a joint solution. We work together for a win-win. So now, what are some new words that we can use and associate with conflict? Opportunity, resolution, care, relationship building, progression, moving, constantly moving forward. So hopefully you see conflict in a new light and it sounds like we do. So positive, you heard opportunity, gain, collaboration, working together, growth. Hopefully not only the person that I'm leading will grow, I need to grow too. It's not just about them, it's about me growing as well. Adversity creates growth, it really does. That's why it's not a good idea a lot of times to run from adversity. Uh, it's just like when you're working out and working your muscles, those muscles, the tears and everything that happen actually produce growth in those muscles. So we want to work them out and keep moving forward and work them so that we can grow and we can gain. So remember, it is our response as leaders that will determine whether a conflict outcome will yield positive or negative results. And my smiley face at the end. <laughs> so what I wanna just end with and say is just thank you. I, I just consider this 
an awesome opportunity to stand before you today. And uh, I want you to know that the job that you do, whether you're an SPD, OR, whatever you do, even my fellow census uh, family, um, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I want you to know that your job, what you do matters. It is of great importance. And so I encourage you to go for everything that you can. Don't let conflicts or anything like that scare you away or push you away from any goal that you're trying to get towards. Look for those areas in your own life, just as I do on a daily basis, um, that I can do better. I want to do better. I want to be better. I want to be a better leader. Um, I want to be a better husband, better father, better grandpa. So look for those opportunities in your life to grow, to gain. Um, they're always there. The opportunities are always there. Sometimes we push them away because we're not quite ready and we want to avoid some things, but embrace those things because they will help you grow and develop in the areas that you're trying to get to. So I want to thank each and every one of you for the job that you do. I know it's not easy. You lose sleep, you lose time, uh, time with your families, different things like that. But know that the job that you're doing is creating a difference in so many lives, so many lives. So thank you um, and go forth and get it done. Thank you, everybody.